bless the Lord this morning to be in his presence. For this is the day that the Lord has made. That we can rejoice and be glad in it. Tell your neighbor this is the day that the Lord has made. And in him we can rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Good to see all of us in the house of the Lord. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Bishop and Mom and the pastoral team for affording me this opportunity to be here that I can share the word of God with us. My name is Moses Chege. I love the Lord. He is my personal savior. I know my family is around and I want just to acknowledge my wife who is in the service and want to thank God for her and to thank God for my family that because of them, I am who I am today. Uh, we'll be bringing the word of God and uh, I will be reading my title message today. I have entitled it to what we are, the theme of this year. And the message today is on laying off so as to amount or laying off to, um, to mount up. And the theme of the year has been on mounting up. And I want to believe that so much has been talked about mounting up to a point of us asking ourselves, what are we mounting up to? And I want to think or to imagine that this question is to all of us that at one given time you're asking yourself, what do I want to amount to? Because the theme can be we are mounting up, but what are you mounting up to as an individual? But the word of God has so many things that it talks to us about on how to mount up. And I would be picking the word of God from the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and from verse 1 to verse 3. Hebrews 11 from verse 1 to verse 3. And this is what the Bible says. Now faith, Hebrews, I read, this reads here. Yeah. Therefore, 11, 12, not 11, sorry. 12, chapter 12. Thank you. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Praise the Lord. I think when we read that part of the word of God, there are so many things that it talks about as to what we should do or to what a believer should do. And thinking of this, then it starts by saying, since or therefore, or since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And that's to say that you are in a race or you are in a walk, and the walk that you are in is the walk of faith. But in the walk that you are in, the Bible starts, or here Paul is trying to tell us that even as we walk, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. So to say that you are not alone. There are people that are looking up to us to see how do we carry about or how do we go on with our salvation or how do we live our salvation. But it continues to say, then therefore throw off or lay everything that hinders. And why should, it, should we lay off or should we put off everything that hinders us? It is because there are things that come our way that cause us not to be able to run that race that is marked before us. And he says one of those things that cause us not to do so is sin that so easily entangles us. And for that reason, then it means that all of us at one point or another as a believer, and even if not yet a believer, there is a race that God has set before us. And in that race, God wants us to run. And as we run that race, he realizes there are things that can make us not to run that race as we ought to. 
And the thing that has been picked first is that there are many things that entangle us. And one of those things that entangle us that make us not to run is that sin that he says that so easily entangles us. And we may ask ourselves, do I have sin? And is it possible that I could have sin? And it's possible. It is possible that since we are human beings, there are many times that we could have sin that so easily entangles us. But we continue to read and to pick from the same verse, and we realize Paul saying, run then with perseverance that uh, the race that is marked before us. And as we think of then running with perseverance, it says things will not just happen. For you to be able to run the race that is before you, there are things that you'll have to do different from every other person. Because we can run a race, and I think in this country we have enough examples of people that have run races and they have won the races. And if we maybe pick from them when we see them training, when we see them practicing, or waiting to run a race that is before them, we see them enduring, we see them sweating out so that they can be prepared for the race that is marked before them. But I want to submit to us that the race we have been called, there is no practice. There will be no rehearsals like I'm running today because tomorrow I will start my salvation. You are called into salvation and there and then you started your race. Or there, is there any one of us who has been given a time to rehearse? Have you been rehearsing that now I will be starting my salvation a day after tomorrow or next year? I want to believe all of us found ourselves in the race. And that race is that, the race that Paul is telling us we need to run with perseverance. But what would cause us to run that race with that perseverance? Paul tells us of Jesus and he says, looking into Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Meaning, for you to run that race, there has to be something that you have to look up to so that you can endure that race or you can be able to carry on with the race. But interestingly, even as we think of this year, and mounting up, then he finishes that portion of the scripture by saying, consider him who endured such shame that you may not grow weary and lose heart. And I think that ties back to what the Bible is telling us in the book of Isaiah. That for us to be able to mount up, for us to be able to get to what God wants us to become, then we have to look up to God. We have to trust him so that we may not grow weary. Because he says, even the youth, even the young people grow weary. They can faint. But them that hope in the Lord, them that trust in the Lord, then they will get wings or they will renew their strength and they will soar up with the wings. Do these wings just grow? You ask yourself, have we seen any one of us with wings that they are sewing up? It means that in the hope that we have in God, there is inner power that is given us that every time we feel like we are losing hope, then that hope is rekindled and then we mount up. And I want to believe having gone through the period that we have gone through, seeing you here, it's because you have been mounting up. Seeing you here is because there is some renewal of newness in your heart and in your life that is causing you to become what you are. But something also interesting in this portion of scripture is that the race that we are run running has no checkpoints. At no one time have you been running and someone has waited at a certain point to tell you, brother, sister, you are doing well. Keep it up. How did we encourage each other to that point of saying, brother, I have been looking at you and you are doing well. It is not possible to know whether I'm doing well or I'm not doing well. Because hardly do we bring things that show that I'm not doing well. We will always say I'm doing well. And I pick this from maybe looking at the races, the rare races that we have mostly in our country and outside. There are checkpoints where drivers are told you are doing well. You are gaining points. Keep on moving. You are not uh, battery off. You are within time. Keep moving. But I want to submit to us that in the race that we are in, there are no checkpoints. Nobody has told you, how far have you come since you gave your life to Christ? Are you getting closer or you are, you are drawing far off from where God expects you to be? And so that is even worrying, knowing that there is nothing that indicates to me today that I have done so well to be where God wants me to be. Only that. 
your soul and your spirit can testify whether we are drawing closer to God or we are drawing further away from God. But God has allowed each one of us to self-regulate, to know what you are doing, how you are doing it. And therefore, he has given us things that we should do so that we can tell ourselves, how close am I getting to God? And some of the things that he allows us to do is he has allowed us to pray. And in prayers, we know whether we are connecting with God or whether we are not connecting with God. The word of God also comes handy to help us know, am I desiring more of God? Am I thirsting for more of God? Even as you self regulate I don't know how much of your time you have spent to pray for yourself or to take time and say, I'm setting time, not because of the ch church has said, but I have purpose to pray because I feel I'm not doing well. And I want to connect with God. Praise the Lord. God has allowed you to self-regulate. Tell someone, I self-regulate. Praise the Lord. God has given you to know where, how far you want to go. How close you want to become to him. He has allowed that to be done by you and to be done by me. And the Bible in book, the book of Ezekiel without even reading, it tells us of Ezekiel and he's told to measure or to go into waters. And he's asked to go there. And as he entered, then every time he entered, it's like measuring the level of godliness in him. And so at one point, he's in the waters. And at this point, he is asked, how deep are the waters? And he says, the water is just, just by ankle deep. And then he's told, move on further. And he moves further and he says, it's at uh, knee deep. And he is encouraged to move further, which says, as God wants us to self-regulate, he's also encouraging us not to remain by the peripheries. He's encouraging us to come closer to him, to move from where we are just ankle deep in him to getting deeper and deeper with him. And you know what? Any time we don't move closer to God, any time we remain at the edges of the water, that's the moment, that sin that so easily entangles us that comes in. But the more we move deeper, and the angel of God is measuring how deep we are, then we are able to get closer to God and to get to know what God desires of us. As we speak of that, I want to just look at a few things to consider even as we talk of mountain. And I want to pick an example. And I want to think of uh, some times I have thrown. And I have realized that going at the airport and looking at the planes there, they all look great. And some of them looking at them from outside, you even wonder, can this gigantic thing lift up? Can this big thing even take off? And every time, if by any chance you happen to fly that plane, you are wondering, will it take off? Will it get off ground? But you realize it is possible to get off ground because in it, there is power to fly. And I look at all of us this morning, and maybe someone would be asking, is it possible for you to fly? Is it possible for you to lift up? Is it possible for you to take off and to become what God wants you to become? And I want to tell you, you have the power. And one of the things that I have realized, even as I went about, when God allowed me to travel around, is that those planes, when they take off, they take off and they take off in a certain way. And one of the moments I have had an experience is when a plane that was just about to take off, we were on the runway. But Ritro, did you know that that plane was not ready to take off? So it just accelerated, and as we thought we were just about to take off, the plane stopped and took a turn and went back to the starting point. And it was so scary. Because at every given time a plane wants to take off and it runs the whole runway, you don't expect it to stop. You expect it to, turn, to take off and go. But we turned back and we started afresh. And I was just thinking of that and I felt... It is possible even us as believers. There are those moments that we have prepared ourselves to take off. But sometimes it has not been possible for you to take off. But I want to encourage you that it's possible to go back to the starting point And prepare yourself afresh and say you are taking off. Because the Lord knows you have the potential. Tell someone, I have the potential. I can take off. 
I can mount up because the Lord has given you that power. It is chaos to imagine that you can always be trying. You can always be thinking that you are taking off, but you are not taking off. But I want to tell you that the Lord knows, even though things may look like you cannot take off, it is possible that you can take off. Maybe it will just require us to, take, to go back to the starting point. It may just require you to ask yourself, what is it that makes me not to lift up? What is it that makes me not to mount up in every area of your life? Because the Lord knows you can take off. The Bible tells us of that in Isaiah. And it says in the same part that we have read many times. It says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. When we think of that, it then says there is a sequence of doing things. To God, you don't just run. You don't just start by running or walking. But the Lord is saying, them that hope or them that wait upon the Lord. What would be the difference? You know, the world does things just for the sake of doing them. But you see, we have started by saying that there is a cloud of witnesses that is surrounding us. And that crowd is looking at how you will mount up. And you know, in the world, everything goes. It's every system goal. Because the end justifies the means. But in our case, then the Lord expects us to first come to him and say, I'm waiting on the Lord. And so when you ask yourself, what is waiting upon the Lord? Waiting upon the Lord is looking eagerly for with or lay in wait or linger. And if that has to happen, then it means we have to wait or to eagerly wait or look to him or lay in wait or linger somewhere so that the Lord can come through. And you know we are not patient. Many are times that the Lord has told us, I will come through for you. But little do we know that the Lord may not come immediately as we expect him to come. But does he not come? The Lord will come up. And again, I thought of it and I thought of the many times travelers want to move from one point to another. And many are times that their travels are delayed. And this is quite okay or quite uh, uh, very seen at the airports. You have moved maybe from here very early in the morning, hoping that you catch your plane at around 7 in the morning. But only to get there and be told that you know what? Your plane is not available. You'll have to wait for another three hours. And after three hours, you're told it's still not possible. You will not travel. So you keep waiting until maybe at midnight. You're told now you can travel. It is true they will apologize. They will give you excuses. They will tell you as to why you did not fly. But the thing is, it is also happens to us as believers that the many times that the Lord wants to come through, at times he doesn't come as we expect him. Maybe you have your own timing. You are chronos. But there is that time of God that God wants to come through for you. That time that God has set and we want to show himself faithful. And that's the time that the Lord comes. Has anyone ever remained at the airport forever? Does the, do those airplanes come? Are they made available at a certain time though you have waited? It's same with God that even though you have waited for long, the Lord will come through. And so you cannot lose hope because the Lord is saying, them that hope in the Lord, them that wait in the Lord, then they will renew their strength. It is not in your timing. It is in the timing of God that he comes through to bring to pass that which he has said or talked about, about you. I want to bring this to say something. And when we look at what the Bible is telling us, the Bible is then saying a few things that we need to think of even as we wait on the Lord. And I want to bring a few things to us in terms of laying off so that we can be able to mount up. Number one, or point number one, in us Raying off so that we can mount up. Is that every time we have laid off, then we have a standing with God. We have a right standing with God. God places us into a place that now we can say, God, I'm here. 
No matter what happens, I'm not going to move because you have said and you have spoken. In the book of John chapter 5, 15 and verse 14 to verse 15, it says this about God and those that are his. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For servants do not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard my father, I have made known to you. Praise the Lord. Do you think of God who becomes a friend to you? That the moments that you have been able to establish a friendship with God, then that friendship should trigger things that will come your way in a way that you don't struggle to get them. Because in us mounting up, then it first starts, it starts by us asking ourselves, how are we mounting? All what will make us to mount? But the right thing for a believer is where we come first to God and we establish a relationship with him. We make our standing with God proper. We make our standing with God right. And this is where God is saying, then you are no longer enemies. I'm calling you friends. And to friends then God says, I don't have secrets of things that I do, but I make them open. I bring them to pass to them so that they can see who I am into their lives. And I don't know what great thing that can happen to our life than becoming friends with God. Though this friendship is conditioned because he's saying, if you keep my commands, then you become my friends. But as much as there is a condition to becoming a friend of God, I think this is the greatest thing that can happen to us to help us mount up with a lot of ease. And I want to say this, that the many times I have enjoyed a fellowship with God, I don't struggle to become what I want in God. Because I'm a friend of God. And the Bible tells us of Abraham as a friend of God. And the Bible says, can I do something without revealing it to my servant? Can God just allow things to happen without him revealing them to you? And it's possible maybe he may not reveal them to you. But the thing is, as long as God be on your side, then he makes things to come in a way that he gives you grace to carry through such moments of your life. And for us to be able to establish that kind of friendship, then Romans 5 and verse 14 tells us, those who walk in the spirit then, desire things of the spirit. The spirit is life. He gives our mortal bodies life. He quickens us. He condemns the spirit of sin and death in us. And he makes us to be able to think about the things of God as opposed to the think thinking about the things of the flesh. For he says, being in the flesh is an enmity with God. Such that we cannot understand the things of God, for we cannot even please him. So for us to be able to move to a point where God wants us to become friends, then we have to become that person that walks in the spirit so that we can have right standing. You cannot please God, no matter how you try it. As long as you're not walking in the spirit, we cannot please God. Could you be a friend of God so that you cannot miss his secret? He is willing to reveal this secret. Number two, in us mounting up, is for us to be able to look up. And in looking up, the Bible tells us in verse two of the part of the Bible that we read, Hebrews, it says, uh, it says that as we run the race with endurance, as Jesus ran the race, he is calling us to look up unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And when you look at the original meaning of the word look up, it brings a few things, and it has three things that it talks about that. And it says, looking up means relying on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. And we know we have sung this song saying, leaning on Jesus. That as we sing that song, we have said, as long as we lean on him, then we are safe and secure from all alarms. Because we have learned to lean on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus, it says, or leaning means, from the original meaning, it says it has that idea of zeroing in or having our gaze on something we have confidence in. So when you lean on Jesus, then you are saying, I'm zeroing, not on anything else. But my gaze is on him alone. And it's him that I see in the circumstances that I'm in. 
On the same, it says, Jesus then becomes our encouragement in the race. Both as an example and as our help. He's an example to us because he, for, he was our forerunner who has gone before us. He lived faithfully in this world, trusting the Father and yielding to his will. He has left us an example that we might follow in his step. On the same, it talks of, of Jesus as, as our help and it says, Jesus is the one who we drove our power from. He's the one who has given us life and has set the helper to be with us forever. For we run this race only because of his word and only by the power of the spirit. So we look up to him. We lean on him. Praise the Lord. Number two on leaning on, it also means looking up to him means not just looking. And not just looking means it's where we have no distraction. Because you can be looking at things and you are just looking, but you have other distractions that carries you away from focusing on the main object that keeps you going. So when we say looking into Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, he's saying, I have not whatsoever distraction, but I'm looking only to him because him makes our things different. And so without having the distraction, one of the scholars, Peter O'Brien, notes that the prefix to the Greek verb translated looking actually carries the meaning of looking away from all other towards one. So you turn away from all others because there are many distractions. And as Peter says there, he says, then you are looking from all others but one. And I want to ask us, do we have the Jesus as the only one that we are looking up to? Does he mean everything to us? The, that meaning of this, this word looking up, it also says it means looking to him alone. And looking to him alone means that it's God who we have enthroned and we have given the only share of our lives. Because God is jealous. He does not want you to have him and have something else that you're saying, the alternative, all I have, plan B. That if this doesn't work, then this one else will work. And lastly, still on looking up, it says looking up also means loving. Love, uh, looking to Jesus, he is our reward. There is a uh, parallel in the passage between where we look in our running and where Jesus looked in his. That text says that Jesus, our forerunner, for the joy that was set before him, then he endured the cross. And for that reason then, he subjected himself so that he can win that which was before him. And so the question is, even as we run the race that is before us, what is it that makes us to run the race? It says he looked to God because he knew he would be seated at the right hand of God. And so he was not distracted by the many things, the pain, the agony, but looked at Jesus. To you and me, Jesus is our first forerunner. He is the person that we need to look at and say, if he ran the race, if he endured the race, then I can also endure the race because he first ran the race for us. Praise the Lord. Jesus becomes our goal. He becomes the love of our, of our life. We yearn for him. We want to be like him. We want to have fellowship with him. And it's him that informs our race. I don't know what informs your race this morning. Whether you are informed because of the things that you want to say, I want to be better. You know, we can run races and all that we are doing is because I want to uh, outwit someone. I want to be better more than someone. I want to be the person, the guy in the estate that when I drive in here, people will say he has come. But Jesus is saying, if you run the race, then you are looking at him. He looked at the Lord or looked at God. And so he endured so that he can partake of the joy that was set him before him. What makes you to run the race? Why are you in the race? What is driving you to run the race? Praise the Lord. I believe that the Lord is enabling us to run the race looking at him. Point number three for us to be able to mount up is confessing our sin. And in confessing our sins, I want to come to us and say that God has always given us a lifeline. And a lifeline in this sense, 
uh, in one of the classes in uh, evangelism, we have always taught that every time we fall in sin, God has always given us a desire to come back to him. And it's given in an example of us breathing in and us breathing out. That every time we have fallen into sin, because you know, First John 1 and 9, 19 tells us that if we say we do not have sin, then we are lying before him. But he says, if we confess those sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all those sins that entangles us. So in breathing out, then God expects us to come to him and breathe out every moment and release everything that we causes us not to run the race. And not only that, but even as we release, then he expects us to breathe in. I don't know how many times you can, st- or how long you can stay without breathing in. Normally, it's not possible. We are told by scientists that you cannot go for five minutes without breathing in. But you know, we can let God be out of our life for so long. Yet the Lord desires that every time we fall in sin, that we come back to him and breathe out and breathe in the life of the Holy Spirit. It's that life that causes us to keep going. Maybe you came to church today and you are feeling so overweighed. You came to church today and you are saying, this entanglement, this thing that has held me so back. But the Lord is giving us an opportunity this morning that we can come to him and say, Lord, I release. Lord, I partake that which you have. Because his spirit is here. And all he wants us is to partake of him. And I think those exercises that we used to do and we are told, breathe in would come so handy in our spiritual life that we can always wake up every morning and tell ourselves, I'm breathing in the life of Christ into my life so that the day can be better, the day can be beautiful. Praise the Lord. Have you breathed the life of Christ? And if by any chance you have not, God is giving us an opportunity that in our waiting, it is then that we, give our, we get our renewal. And this renewal don't just happen. It comes by indulgence. And in that indulgence, it's where we seek God. And as we seek God, we get to know him and we get to be known by him. I don't know how good it would be that the Lord says, I know him. When you can stand and so the Lord is thinking of me because he knows me and he knows me by name. Lastly, in us lifting up, the kingdom of God, God requires us to seek his kingdom first. I know we have so many things that come our way every other day. But in this one scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, I saw something else under the sun. And he says, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither the bread to the wise, nor the wealth to the intelligent, nor the favor to the skillful. For time and chances happen to them all. Praise the Lord. Do you feel at times like you have done so much and yet you are not lifting up? You have done, you have done all that you need to do, but you have not been able to mount up to what you have, you have always wanted to mount up to. The Lord is telling us the race is not to the swift. It is not how well you are in papers. It is not how good you are, skillful in doing things. But the Lord is saying that God will give us time and chances to become what he wants us to become. And I can attest to that that it's not because of how good, how better I have been in this world that I am what I am today. And I want to believe it's also not because of how well, how good you are, that you are what you are. What you are. But the Lord is saying that he will give us time and chances. He will bring them our way. But all that then he requires us is to know that the time has come. It's that moment of us remaining friends with him. So that when these opportunities come, we can say, Lord, it's my time. We can grab those opportunities and say, Lord, my time has come. We can be able to tell God, this time, Lord, you are not passing me by. Because the Lord is always in business of making himself known. Our blessing is tied so closely to our walking with him. Doors of favor will open before us because we have come to know him. And imagine if God, as we said, he becomes your friend. Can a friend leave you when you don't have that which you are seeking? Can a friend, if he's really genuine, not tell you that this is what is happening and I'm going to take you there? 
It is us by coming to him. He says, I will lay a table before your enemy. I will showcase my greatness because God is a Jirasi God. When will God defend himself? And Moses at one point, he asks God, if you destroy them, what will the nation say? Praise the Lord. You have brought them this far. If you destroy them now, what will the nation say? They will say that you delivered them and you have brought them to kill them here. Do you think God has such a mission with you? Do you think God wants to destroy you? The Lord has no mission to destroy you, but he's there to make you what he wants you to become. And so he says, I will lay a table before you. I will open ways before you. I will satisfy you with goodness. I will bring to pass that which you have sought of me, so that I may glorify myself in you. And lastly, he says, my eyes are moving across the earth, looking for someone that he may show himself righteous. Imagine at that place of work, in that business, the Lord is moving. His eyes are moving across that he may show himself righteous and he may show himself faithful. In finishing, we have talked about mounting up. And in mounting up, then the question would be, what is it that I need to lay off? What is it that so easily entangles me? And when you think of the word entanglement, it means it's every time I try to move, then I find something that causes me to fall. But the Lord is also willing to help us be able to put off that which so easily entangles us. And I think I remembered of when I thought of this message, I thought of those times I was a boy in high primary school and would go to the field to play. And where I come from, there are those grass, you know, and it's so intertwined that you'd want to run, but every time you ran, it would just entangle you and you fall. And it so happened that sin sometimes can be like that. It can be like that grass that every time you think your way is now clear, you just realize something else has just cropped up. But the Lord is saying he has a way of helping us to disentangle ourselves so that we can run the race that is coming, that is before us. He promises. That promise is activated even as we look at the promise giver because he says, he who has promised, he grows no weary. His understanding is no, cannot be fathomed. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power to the weak. That's the God that you have come to worship this morning. That's the God that is in this place this morning. That's the God that wants to meet with you. And in finishing, want to bring to us and ask ourselves, even as we stand before God, and have we had moments to breathe? Sometimes maybe we are here and you have not asked the Lord to let you go. I look at moments that have gone to God and I'm so far away from him. But every time I have approached his throne and then I live there energized. And I thought of it and I thought of this advert of energizer battery. And there is this battery that runs and at some point it runs out of energy and it's just full. But something just happens and that battery is energized again and it runs as it was expected. We are the same. That we need to go to God every moment. That we can be energized of him. That as we come before him, then he gives us wing. That we are able to mount up. What is it that will stop you this week from mounting up? Is it that fear? Is it that intimidation? Is it that guilt? Is that that worry that you have that says you cannot make it? Is it because people have despised you? The Lord is saying, I give strength to the weary. My understanding cannot be fathomed. Meaning, he knows better than you know. Meaning, he knows you than you know yourself. And this morning, he's able to give you the strength. I would want us to stand. And as we stand, we will be praying to ask the Lord to help us. So that where we are down, where we feel like we cannot make it, then he can come through for us and help us to become what he wants us to become. With every eye closed, we want to pray. And I want to ask, just in the case you'd want to be joined in this prayer, there is the Lord who wants to cause you to become what he wants you to become. You can breathe out this morning, everything. You can release it. You can tell the Lord, I surrender, Lord. I give it up so that you can have your place in me. 
that it's possible that you could already have mounted up. But even in mounting up, I finished by giving a source on illustration that happened one when I traveled. That we just took off somewhere. And just when the pilot said, now or the, the pastor said, we are now starting to cruise. Then another message comes and says that we are going back to our place of departure. Because the door seals were not properly closed. And I want to tell you that was the most scariest moment of our life. Because we could not imagine why on earth would the seals of a door not be closed yet we are already in the air. But this is the same thing. That you could have mounted up already but you have seals that are leaking. Because something is not rightly closed and that can make you to come back to where you started. This morning we can close the seal because the Lord is here to make it possible. Father Lord, in the name of Jesus, I want to give you thanks for a moment as such that we can come to God who cares. We can come to our friend. We can come to one who says, come. Who can come to one who says, let us reason together. And even though our sins, our Father, may be as red as carrot, dear Lord, Father, you say you can make them as white as snow. It is you who have said that, Lord, when you wash us, Father, Lord, you remove far away from us our sin, even as heaven and us are apart, and even forget them, dear Father. This morning I pray for each one of us that if there be anything, dear Father, the Lord can cause us not to mount up, that can lead us, our Father, even to come back to our points of departure, even though we may have taken up off our Lord. We want to thank you that this morning we have a God who washes us. You have a God who cleanses us. And this morning, dear Father, we thank you that even as we run the race, O oh Lord, we want to thank you that we have Jesus and to whom we shall look up to as the only person, as the only person our gaze is on, the person that we shall zero in in the name of your Son. Be glorified, Lord, that none of us will miss him. None of us shall miss the point of looking up to Jesus, the other and the perfecter of our salvation in the name of Jesus. You may be there. You may have not ever prayed a prayer of inviting Jesus into your life. This is the beginning point. It's true, you may be in the service, but you could not have started, you may have not started the race. The race starts when we come to Jesus. You may want to pray this prayer after me. If you lift up your hand, I'll pray with you. Anyone? And want to say, Jesus, come into my life. I realize I'm running, but as I run, I have not started yet. He's willing to start with you. He can help you start that race because he is God. Father, we thank you that your word has been sent forth and you say you follow it to cause it to do that which you sent it for. To all of us, we ask that your power shall be at work in our lives. You shall make us to be what you want. This week, Lord, and the days ahead, we want to thank you that we continue to mount up even with wings because you are on our side. Be glorified in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.